Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. This is the six perfections practice of the bodhisattvas. Thank you for joining us. This teaching will be led by Venerable Yunten. Her full name is actually Bhikshuni Lozong Yunten. She is an American born Buddhist, just to give you a little bit of a background on her for those of you who are not familiar with her. She's been practicing since 1994 and she was ordained in 2003. She actually moved to Chen Rizig Institute, which is in Australia and studied intensively from 2002 to 2009 under Kenzo Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering. He's the Larampa Geshe from Sarah J Monastery and former abbot of Yume Tantric College. She then went on to study retreat and offer service at different Dharma centers across the world, um, becoming an in-depth registered teacher within the FPMT, which is the foundation of the preservation of the Mahayana tradition in 2012. And she's been a resident teacher at multiple centers, including Kunsang Yeshi Retreat Center in Australia and Mahamudra Center in New Zealand, and of course, LMB now. So we are very, very blessed to have her. I'm sure you guys will all enjoy her teachings as much as we do. And, and on that note, I will hand it over to her to go ahead and start the teaching. Venerable Yunten. Thanks so much, Christina. Thanks, nice to see you all. Um, and there's some folks here in the Gompa too. And I think uh, you guys can see them on Zoom under LMB Gompa. So if you're curious who's here, you can see most of them. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing this class weekly. I think that for the sake of community bonding, I really would love it if you would put your videos on. That would be fantastic if you could do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, that's great. Okay, so we'll start with setting our motivation. And the way in which we'll set our motivation is using a prayer related to the six perfections, which is the topic of these weekly Wednesdays. So some of it's going to make sense right away. Some of it will be new or intriguing words. And for the purposes of using it as a motivation, let's just kind of be with it and see what lands. And that which doesn't make sense, you'll just kind of put to one side and make a mental note to come back to so the six perfections are these, and the prayer goes like this. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, of working for the sake of sentient beings, enacting virtuous deeds, and not transgressing the bounds of the pratamoksha, bodhisattva, and tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience, not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii, for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. 
samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so just for a moment, sit with those six based on your understanding so far, whether it's a secular understanding or a Dharma understanding, and think I'm engaging in this class in order to deepen and enrich these concepts, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom. Okay. So the way that we'll do this class is maybe 20, 30 minutes of explanation of the topic that we're up to, and then a bit of discussion and Q&A. And then we'll have a stretch and come back and do a meditation related to what we've been discussing. And then another little follow-up Q&A and dedication. So there's course materials related to these Wednesdays and they include material on all six perfections, the context for them, all of the stuff that we cover in class plus some extra readings. So I really recommend you have a look at those course materials in between sessions just to reinforce what you've learned. Um, completely optional, right? We're all grown ups, we can do what we like, but those course materials will be a good way to reinforce what we're doing week by week. So you don't need to be looking at them during class because the materials will be shared on the screen, but if you're wanting to follow up or review, it's all included in those materials. So for those of you on Zoom, it's in the chat section under the Adobe icon, and uh, for those of you in the Gompa, it's right in front of you. So. Um, before we get started, how many of you feel like you have a basic understanding of the six perfections in, from a Buddhist perspective? Yeah, ish, ish. Yeah, you guys on Zoom. Mostly, yeah, mostly folks have heard this concept. In, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I see a few older students who I know who have done quite a lot of study. Um, and I'm guessing there's a couple folks that are totally new. Is there anyone who is totally new to Buddhism? One, there's one in the Gompa <laughs> or half. Yeah, okay. So please really feel free to jump in and ask questions. The nice thing about a mixed group is that when the beginners ask questions, it reminds the older students of things they forgot. So don't feel like you're taking up time or wasting time. Newer folks, please jump in. And then the people that have been studying for years are like, oh yeah, I did have that question. And then it got lost to time. So um, please feel comfortable to do that. Today, we'll be talking about the context for the six perfections and maybe start to get into them a little bit. Um, let's see. Yep, everyone's in. Okay, so we'll we'll go ahead and get into it. The presentation that I'm going to be doing is coming from the Lamrim Chenmo, which is the great treatise of the stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa. If you're looking at the English translation, it's in volume two, chapter eight. Um, it's only important for those of you that are Dharma nerds, for those of you that are not Dharma nerds, know that this comes from a valid source. The reason we turn to someone like Lama Tsongkhapa is that he was a scholar and a practitioner, both. And that combination of scholar practitioner, and who has then gone on to seemingly have quite a few realizations and become enlightened himself, this all happened in the 14th century. And it was a pivotal time because the Dharma had gotten a bit distorted. Yeah, people had kind of co-opted bits and pieces, bits and pieces were missing. So I think that there's a parallel with what can happen today. People, lots of people know a little bit about Buddhism. So you think lots of people know a tiny bit about Buddhism. Something like we like to meditate, compassion is good, try not to kill stuff like general understanding. Karma is something like what goes around comes around something. So there's like a lot of just kind of 
vague understanding of what we're about. And then classes that explain from a very simple, um, accessible way, which is lovely. But then you'll get things that are like pop mindfulness, right? Or um, corporate mindfulness, how to be a really good centered worker, right? And make money as focused as you can, completely divorcing it from the context, which is and concentration to be a good thief, but that's not why we're developing concentration. You know, you need a lot of patience in order to scam people, but that is not why we're talking about patience. So what happened in the 14th century is happening now as well, where people cherry pick and then they mix it with other things and then they leave out stuff. And sometimes it's benign, and sometimes it's totally well-intentioned and is still very useful. For example, some conversations with psychologists or neuroscientists or quantum physicists, taking certain aspects of Buddhism and marrying them with other types of knowledge can be really enriching and really beneficial. But then you get the other side of it, which is not so good. <laughs> can you think of some examples of Buddhism being cherry-picked and then married with something else, and then it gets weird? Yeah, what happens with Buddhist Tantra meeting misunderstandings of Tantra? What happens with mindfulness divorced from empathy? <laughs> you know, what happens if these things are used in the wrong way? So someone like Lama Tsongkhapa was really powerful in his time because he realized there were gaps and things missing. So he actually traveled and got the missing pieces. And then he got everything back together and then he put it back in order based on Atisha's work, because during the time of the Buddha, it's not like he taught in order. <laughs> it's not like in the beginning of his life, he taught the beginning of the path, and then the middle of his life, the middle of the path, end of his life, end of the path. It wasn't tidy like that. It was just to whoever was in front of him at their level is where he spoke. So you have this like 40 years of teachings all out of order, and you need people who actually have a deep understanding to be able to say, this comes first, this comes second. So riding the wave of Atisha's work, Lama Tsongkhapa was able to put everything back in order, get it back complete and say, the six perfections are the heart of the path, but they're also towards the end. So we're doing it, even though some of us don't have foundations or preliminaries, because the assumption is we're already on board with being a good citizen, right? Or being a kind parent or being a compassionate partner or being somehow li living an intentional life. So I'm guessing that everyone here in some way would like to live an intentional life that is in some way of benefit to society. And so you're already on board with that, even if you're not Buddhist. And then more than you know, just being someone living an intentional life, I'm guessing there's also some sense that you don't always practice and live up to your own ideals. The ideals that you yourself have chosen, that you love and adhere to and value more than anything, still you might be unkind and impatient to your closest friends, let alone people you don't like. <laughs> You know, just people you actually like, you're not even totally kind to in a consistent way. So there's probably already been a moment where you have seen the disconnect between what you love and aspire to and how you actually are in a day-to-day -day way. And because people that come to Dharma centers are adults who have done some sort of work of that genre, we can kind of skip a few steps and go straight to the end and the deep work of the perfections. But that doesn't mean that going back over the preliminaries is somehow unnecessary just because intellectually we get it. Remember the preliminaries are going to ground you and expand your foundation in such a way that the more you build on it, the steadier it will be. So some of those things that come before the six perfections, that come before the Mahayana path, that really make sure your foundation is stable, are what? <laughs> what are the things you need to understand before you really can practice something like the six perfections? Jump on in. I know some of you know. Yeah, go ahead, Gompa. Precepts. Precepts. When you say precepts, what do you mean? Um. Well, I practice in a 
different traditions. So I don't know if it's exactly the temple of Kisidama, but it's a very well Thanks. Um, I practice in a different tradition. Sure. I don't know if it's the same as in uh, Tibetan. Do you mean the, the lay vows, like not to kill, not to steal, those ones? Yeah. Yep. So practicing the precepts are for sure, for sure, a preliminary, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And all. Renunciation. Hmm. Hundred percent. Yeah. Renunciation. And what do what do you understand that word to mean? Well, um, it's it's key to the Hinayana path, and I mean it's it's the end re, it's the end goal, I guess, which would just be renunciation of samsara and a desire for your own individual enlightenment, at least, right? So which would be just you know, and I know it's 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 inferior to the Mahayana path, but it's would, would that also mean that it's preliminary? <clears throat> well, not inferior. I would say 100% not inferior. I would say foundational. So there is a hierarchy in that sense, foundational, but not a hierarchy in terms of value because we couldn't skip the foundational vehicle and then just magically become Mahayanists. You actually couldn't ever have real bodhicitta if you didn't have renunciation which is one of the hardest things for us to understand, I think. I think that we all are on board with working for the welfare of all as the general premise. You know, we're inconsistent and full of hypocrisy, but that's only human, but like we like the premise, but how does having a determination to be free from your negative habits, behaviors, drives, mean that somehow your bodhicitta is gonna be better or more authentic? Like what's the relationship between those two is something to sit with. And can you really want all sentient beings to be free from their suffering? If you don't fully understand your own suffering and fully understand the ways in which you need freedom from your own, you know, like we'd like to jump over the step of looking at our mess. Wouldn't we, right? Like we'd like to say, let's just help people and not ever look at how much we're in pain or why we're in pain, or why we're distracted, yeah, or why we're confused. We'd rather not look at that. Let's just jump to helping others because then we can feel like productive citizens and we get a stamp of approval and validation and our life can go on and uh, we're a good kid and we die thinking I was good, <laughs> right? But if you never sit with, why am I in pain? Why am I unfocused? Why am I not as happy as I feel like I could be given the amazing resources in my life and the beautiful relationships I have? Why am I not as happy as I could be? So renunciation, Roxy's like 100%, like you need renunciation before the six perfections, which are related to bodhicitta, can really be strengthened and really have the momentum all the way for enlightenment. But it's, it's a tricky one to sit with because it feels kind of basic to say, I want to be free from samsara first, and I want full enlightenment second. It feels kind of funny. But yeah, you go, go ahead. There's a good question. Um, another preliminary important one is having great respect for the teacher and the teaching. Yep, great respect for the teacher and the teaching, which is straight from the Lam Rim Chen Mo, which is really related to the work of Atisha, Lama Tsongkhapa, and the Buddha himself. So if you feel like these are valid sources, you're more likely to listen deeply. It's not like they need you to respect them. They're fine, they're happy, they're enlightened, they don't need your respect, but you respecting them means that you're receptive. So that definitely is huge foundation, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. We name like the samsara path is something to renounce, but easier said than done, right? I mean, first of all, like I'm not sure exactly what the samsara path is, and second of all, I know that there's some likely aspects of my samsara path that are easier to relatively renounce than other ones, which I can't renounce. At all. <laughs> so does that mean I'm not even at the precursors for this course? Yes, exactly. Well done. <laughs> yes, exactly. But also join the club, right? Don't worry, join the club. Um, yeah, what are you even renouncing? What does that even look like? Does that mean I can't even practice the perfections? Oh, no. Yeah. 
And for us, we're practicing the perfections in this aspirational way that understands that just loving them and appreciating them means that they're a lot more likely to kick in in our daily life, even while we're still babies, totally attached to samsara, totally addicted to sensory stimulation, to entertainment, to validation, to all sorts of pleasures even though we are very much addicted to the assumption that all of our pain is coming from the outside or from a fundamental fatal flaw within ourselves and we're inherently bad or both depending on the day, right? We're still quite addicted to those beliefs. And despite being addicted to those beliefs, we can still aspire to the perfections and weave them in from the very beginning, even though we don't have those foundations yet. And it all becomes kind of mutually collaborative when you're looking at the path to enlightenment. If you look at it like an outline, it's just this tidy, like step one, step two, step three, as if life is that tidy, you know, life is not that tidy. Like I will now spend several months working on understanding my perfect human rebirth and the value of the teachings. Now several months finding my guru, um, developing a relationship, taking precepts from them, and I'm going to look at death and impermanence. Yep, got that. Absolutely. I'm going to die. Not going to waste my life. Moving on. Like, who practices that way? We kind of see the whole path. And then we go back to the beginning. And then we go through the whole path. And we go back to the beginning. And we keep getting the whole picture. And at first, it's just fuzzy, isn't it? You have the whole picture of how to get enlightened. But it's fuzzy. And certain bits are quite clear and high definition. And some parts are kind of obscure, but you know they're there somewhere. And as time goes by, more and more of the picture is clear to you. And then as the picture gets clearer, how to actually start occurs. So I think sometimes we get this idea that we should start at the beginning without knowing the end. Yeah, and it's kind of important to know where you're going before you even start. Sometimes it feels like by starting at the end, we don't need to do the beginning. So that can happen too. So there's all these kind of tricky pitfalls in being a spiritual practitioner or someone on the path where we don't understand the relationship between understanding something and practicing it. There is the wisdom that's developed through hearing which is just study and listening to classes and reading books and just taking it in, there is a wisdom that is developed by purely taking it in. And then there's a wisdom of reflection or analysis, which is when you actually engage with what you've heard, when you come to an understanding about what you've heard, and when you're marrying it up with your life experience and your logic. That's a wisdom, you know, and those two are not meditation. And still you're developing wisdom. It's not like you have to wait to develop wisdom by meditating. It's not like our main project, especially in the beginning. Meditation is the main project once you get it and you're convinced. And getting it and being convinced are not necessarily the same wisdoms. The wisdom of hearing is not the same as the wisdom of reflection, though they rely on one another. Yeah, Teresa, Mike. It might have already been said, but in the beginning, I need to take refuge, which for me means this is what I believe will actually bring me true happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Refuge is huge. Refuge is huge and very much related to renunciation, because once you see the way in which 99.9% .9 of your suffering comes from yourself, then you ask yourself, how am I going to get out of this mess? Who has done it? Can it be done? You know, and then you turn to refuge. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Other kind of foundations before this like amazing altruistic attitude come to you kind of organically. What else needs to happen? I'm not sure about this, but what about all of the preliminary practices, not necessarily the teachings, but the practices that we do, like the Vajrasattva and the mandalas and all of those types of things? Is it suggested that those are done prior to the six perfections and studying that? 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. She's she's referring to the like technical preliminaries, right? Like doing your preliminaries and doing your preliminaries is a preliminary to what? <laughs> right, doing your preliminaries is a preliminary to doing three-year retreat. Yeah. It's so you don't necessarily have to, you know, it's, you don't need to do those. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say that, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not going to say that, but yes. The preliminaries are a way for you to clear the cobwebs. Right. And they're a way for you to get mental momentum. And it, I think it's just important for us to think before we met Buddhism, how did we learn things that we actually took on board? Like there's a million things that we have learned. Yes, school and life, we've learned a lot of things. But of the things that we've learned, what do we actually practice? You know, take something really basic, like the three meals you know how to cook in my case. You know, you guys probably all know how to cook many things, but I know, I know how to make three things really well and that's it. So the three things that I've learned how to cook, um, there had to be some prep involved. And before I even started the prep of what are the things that need to happen, I had to like the food. Yeah, I think I like that food. I want to learn how to make it. And so there was inspiration. And it was within my own best interest because I can have my friend make this food I like and have it whenever I'm with them, or I can make it for myself. And then I can have it always. Yes. So, so take something that you've learned, but more than learned that you actually practice and is yours now and ask yourself, what were the components that made it stick? What made you actually weave it into your life? Because understanding alone has not ever been enough. There has to be understanding and inspiration, aspiration. It has to feel in your own best interest even if it's for the benefit of others, we have a built-in selfish tendency that must be acknowledged before it can be overcome, right? So it's in your own best interest. So I could add to, now I can make my favorite meal and now that I make it, I'm healthy and strong and beneficial to society. So I'm gonna keep making it so that I stay strong and healthy. But my first motivation was, I like it, it's good for me. Yes, I like it. It's good for me. I'm healthier eating this. I'm happier eating this. So I'm going to eat it. I'm going to learn how to make it. Yes, if I pretend that I make my favorite food in order to benefit all sentient beings, that is not true. <laughs> right? It's my curry. You're not having it. It's mine. <laughs> right? But once you kind of develop some proficiency, the urge to share arises whether it's sharing the energy from having had it or it's sharing the way to do it, the urge to share arises, which is in a way a beautiful indication of our human potential, that we do want to help each other. Even all of our friends' careless attempts to show us things that they love and we have no interest in is a symptom of this, like it works for them, so they want to share it because they love us and don't want us to suffer. So they might say, you know, go on the keto diet or something, you know, random, and you think that's not really for me, but I'm glad it's helping you. Or you're like, how dare you suggest that to me? That has nothing to do with me. Rather than that, you just can hear, oh, they care. It seems to be working for them and they want to share it. That's lovely. So preliminaries for us really have to include why is enlightenment within my own best interest? And then why is enlightenment within the best interest of my work to benefit all sentient beings? Why can't you just be a good person and live a good life and try to recycle and just like be nice citizen? Why do you need enlightenment for yourself? Why do you need enlightenment to benefit others? Yeah, I'm asking. I'm asking. It can be rhetorical, but I'm asking. Yeah, go ahead, Andrea. Um, so that we can show others the path, right? Because we travel. Indeed. indeed, that's that's the one for others. Why do you need yeah. enlightenment for your own self? Oh well, I needed to get off the wheel of samsara. Yeah, yeah. To, just to just to um to fulfill my potential as a human, all of us. Yeah. And um, yeah, to hop off that wheel. 
I mean, I know that's the right answer. I'm still coming around to the conviction on the hopping off the wheel part, but I know um, it sounds good. Yeah, right. It so, comes from a selfish place. For me, it's a selfish place. I started out hating this world and I just wanted to get enlightened. I, I wanted me to get off. And then later I got the helping others part, but it started with, I wanted to end my suffering. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And, and in a way that's as it should be, that's in a way that's a more efficient approach to want to end your own suffering first. And then it occurs to you that other people are also suffering and we want to help them too. The, the Andrea's premise is beautiful and common, which is we want to help others first. And then we're like, Oh yeah, me too. You know, but I'm all right. That that's very common and very natural and very lovely and loving. But at some point you have to have your own, like addicts rock bottom you need to have your samsara rock bottom moment just like someone addicted to anything else and if nothing is particularly wrong in your life it's you can't force a rock bottom and nor should you in a way so how do you get yourself to have the real renunciation that says actually i'm not really as happy as is my birthright as a human being even if I have housing and food and companionship and meaningful work and relative health, somehow that is not enough ingredients for happiness. How come? And then to really deeply see what is it in our thinking that is making happiness less accessible? Yeah, to have the rock bottom moment that says, oh, it's how I think oh no, <laughs> you know, and we all know that we suffer because of how we think about things and the habits we've built because of that. But it's got to be the deep knowing of disillusionment with the inner narrative we've been holding on this whole life and lifetimes, a deep disillusionment. Yeah, Gompa, question? One moment. Can you guys hear the Gompa questions okay? It's more, more just... Um... Yeah, can, yeah, yeah. Yep, nope, and yep. Yeah, go ahead. It's more just a, a question, comment, which is, um, isn't sort of the nature of the mind to kind of constantly bring about suffering in pretty much, maybe not dominantly, but like all the time, and to have the mind go to the negative things, because our minds almost always focus on like loss aversion, cognitive scientists call it that just where we focus on the negative and we fixate on that and that creates so much suffering i would not say it's the nature of the mind to suffer but i would 100 percent say it's the habit of the mind to suffer yeah it's not the nature of the mind to suffer but certainly it's the habit of the mind to suffer almost as a default right like left alone to your own devices in your house by yourself like you're happy content happy content edge of melancholy happy content slight ennui and then devastating depression of doom unless you have a friend call you and then you perk up again but like you don't have to have clinical depression right we all have the first noble truth our mind definitely can default to discontent usually defaults to discontent it's, um, it's a big deal if your default is not discontent. You know, for some folks, their default is kind of neutral or like slightly irritable, slightly annoyed or slightly hyper and excited, which we take to be happiness, but is actually a little wound up and anxiety driven also, right? You're like, I'm not sad. I'm very, very busy. So busy. <laughs> and everyone's like, just <laughs> you know so it's not like it's got to be the deep melancholia of dragging your feet and like just uh why you know it can be also very speedy and neurotic but we're suffering is a default the first noble truth there is suffering is wonderful news because it means that we're not alone in being weird like this yeah like the Buddha started with the truth that we already knew. He didn't start with truths we hadn't accessed yet. And it, it's a great benefit because then you don't have this, something's wrong with me. I have an original sin. I have a fatal flaw. I have a core of badness. No, it's like, oh, wait, all of us? Really? Like that one who's competent and happy, that one who's beautiful and athletic, that one who's rich and famous, wait, all of us are suffering. Okay. Okay, not just me. So then why? 
right? Then you see the brilliance of him teaching the second noble truth. Here's why. Karma and disturbing emotions are why. What are karma and disturbing emotions? They're your mind. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Driven by the fundamental ignorance, which is not a fundamental flaw or a fundamental evil. It's a confusion that can be remedied. A confusion that can be remedied is very good news. And to say that the confusion that can be remedied is not the nature of the mind, is actually a removable aspect of the mind, then immediately you say, so what does that look like? Yeah, and then he taught the third noble truth, cessation, meaning cessation of suffering, yes? Cessation of suffering, but also harmfulness. And so you go, okay, cessation, right? No suffering. Wow, really? No hurting others. Oh my gosh, okay. So how? And then he teaches the path, yeah? So the Four Noble Truths, right? Like keep coming back to them just because they're basic. They are not basic. They are our everyday life. Yes, everyday life. So having real renunciation means you have seen the first and second noble truth really well. Not just the first one, not just the second one, both. And then you really started to aspire genuinely for the third and fourth. So that means you're not disassociated from the fact that we're mostly full of discontent. Even if it's a friendly discontent, even if it's a very busy, productive person's discontent, we all have a lot of discontent. And I thought it would be better than this feeling. You know, you have a good job, but I thought it would be better than this. You have a good partner. You thought it would be better than this. You have gotten some level of health and well-being, but still the digestion's never quite right, you know, or something. Yes, there's just always a little something that's not quite right. Yeah. And if, if there's not that feeling, there is a running over the top of that feeling with a lot of busyness or a lot of a disassociation. Yeah. So that is normal, <laughs> right? That is normal, you are not weird, that is all of us. And so we want the renunciation that is determined to be free from the patterns that cause that, yeah. So when you're sitting with suffering stuff, then actually the first thing is pain, but the second is connection. The second thing is connection. If you can sit with your pain with a little bit of objectivity, and a little bit less identification, just kind of a watching, just like if you were watching someone tattoo you, but you had pain relief medicine and you're just kind of watching it happen and going, oh, look at that line, hmm, look at that line. You know, if you could watch it with a little bit of space from it, then you see it on others and you see the lines in their face and you see the way they hold their body and then you see the way they use words and you can see the suffering in sentient beings because you have seen yourself. And then there is connection and affinity because one of the things that compounds our suffering and makes our suffering so much worse is feeling alone with it, yeah? And this is shown in a million different ways in our life. Like think about if you're going on a hard hike by yourself, you're enjoying the scenery and then you're hurting body, enjoying the scenery, a bit dehydrated, enjoying the scenery, a little less, a little less, you know, like if it's a little out of your reach. But if you're doing that same hike with a bunch of friends at a similar level of fitness and you're all going, oh my God, this is so hard. It's less hard. Yes. If you're all going, oh my God, this is so hard, let's stop and drink water. You're laughing, you're together, you're teasing each other's lack of fitness. There's buoyancy because you're together with your suffering. Yeah. So altruism and getting out of samsara, you know, they are different ways of thinking, different places to think, but they're actually mutually beneficial, which is why in our tradition, it's very common to teach the end even to beginners. Yeah. Is it making sense so far or did you get lost anywhere? Yeah, good, good. Nobody lost too much, okay. <laughs> All right, we'll dig in a little more.
okay, so back to the Lam Rim Chen Mo, which is from Lama Tsongkhapa in this case. We are in the section called How to Train in the Mahayana, which is the great vehicle in general. So you're first establishing a desire to learn the precepts of the mind of enlightenment, which are those vows that are on top of lay people's precepts. So this is common to both lay people and monastics, but it's still an upgrade. And these bodhisattva vows are related very directly to the six perfections and their intentions that you take on voluntarily in order to become enlightened more quickly. So you're doing things that are related to generosity, ethics, patience, etc., And you're also doing things to watch your body, speech, and mind that are a little more elevated than just the five basic vows. So they're trainings. Um, and so you first want to learn them, right? You want to learn them and then you actually take them. And then when you take them, you wanna learn about keeping them and then training and keeping them leads you to the six perfections and practicing them in this elevated way that's just, which isn't like nice cliches, you know, nice kind of ways of thinking, but they're actually imbued with bodhicitta itself. They actually become perfections. Okay, so this word perfection is important to unpack a little bit, especially because the word perfection is quite problematic, especially if you are a perfectionist and want to be perfect, then it is a terrible word for us to use and I'm very sorry. So <laughs> the word that we're using is paramita in Sanskrit, excuse my pronunciation, and in Tibetan is parchen, slightly better pronunciation, but still bad. Okay, so paramita means going beyond the end or reaching perfection. And when done with a bodhicitta motivation, these practices take us beyond samsara to Buddhahood, where all obscurations have been eliminated and all good qualities have been developed limitlessly. The perfections become super mundane when conjoined with the wisdom realizing emptiness. Then the bodhisattva knows that the agent, the object and the action of each perfection arise dependently and are therefore empty of inherent existence. So these are not just ways to be a nice person, these are ways to perfection. And when you hear these words bodhisattva vows and you hear the word vows and then you actually read them and there are 18 bodhisattva vows and 48 secondary offenses and it's like a lot and the very first bodhisattva vow is to refrain from praising oneself and belittling others. And then you think I can really only do that if I don't speak to anyone, <laughs> right? Because pretty much all the day is, I just don't know why people do blah, blah, blah. I always blah, 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 right? Like many of our conversations have that built right in. So you think, despite that being a very good way to live, how can I possibly have a vow like that? I'm gonna break it within a week, yes? if you're self-aware enough to know how you speak to people, yes. Um, and the thing about bodhisattva vows is as Shantideva would say, they're like a beautiful golden vase, incredibly precious, very easy to dent, and also very easy to repair. Yes, think about how gold is soft, yeah? So gold is incredibly precious, you can dent it, just flick in it, but also you can pop it back out again. So the assumption is you will break them. <laughs> right? You would not need to take these vows if you could keep them perfectly. And that is why vows in Buddhism are very different to the way we think of vows in everyday life. So assume that you will not live up to them because the whole point is that they are a training. And by thinking, I want to consciously, just the first one, refrain from praising myself and belittling others, even just thinking that on purpose, makes it less likely to happen. Yeah, especially the day you think of it. Then what if you thought about it a lot on purpose? Then probably less and less, yes? And then what happens if you're not always thinking judgmentally and critically towards people? You probably feel a bit more friendly and relaxed around them because you're not just having this like whining in your head of what is wrong with people. Oh my God, people, come on, people. You know, you don't have that train in your head you can actually enjoy people as they are. 
Yes. So even just that first one, there's 18 of them, right? Just that first one. Amazing. And then of course, one day will come and you'll forget and you'll do the same old thing. And then you confess and purify and say the Bodhisattva verse, prayer verse, which is very short, three times in front of the Buddha. And guess what? Your Bodhisattva vows are back. Ting. Yeah, done. Back. So they're a training and they're a way to lift your game. They should kind of hold and elevate and pull us upward, not feel like a bag of rocks that we're dragging around because we never live up to them. It should make us feel so happy that such ways of living are even spoken about and aspired to because most of the world is telling you, look out for number one. Just look after yourself, look after maybe your family, but really you first and your family better do what you say, otherwise they're no good. But look after you and get a job for you and get things to you and kudos for you and all you all the time and you wonder why you're not happy living that way. <laughs> yes, how amazing it is to have come across a path that is not focused that way. So please never think of the Bodhisattva path is something that is a burden to have found because you could never live up to it. Think of how wonderful it is to even aspire to it. Yeah. How wonderful it would be to live this way always, but also how wonderful it would be to even attempt it just for a few hours because you're changing the tide. Yeah, you're changing the momentum of what your life has said is important so far. Yeah, we all want to be happy. It's completely natural. But the methods for getting happy that we have been taught are not the correct method. Because um, self Um, little peek here back at the slides and then we'll have a break and do a meditation. So the other piece is that for all of the six perfections to be really a perfection, they need this intention to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. But also each perfection should be included within each other. So we take, for example, a small act of generosity, such as giving someone a cup of tea. This can be done with bodhicitta, and it becomes a perfection of generosity, or at least an attempt, yes. And not harming others physically or verbally when giving the tea is ethical conduct. If the recipient harms us or doesn't appreciate the gift, fortitude or patience keeps the mind calm. Giving the tea is done with joyous effort, taking delight in being generous. Then stability of mind or concentration is necessary so the mind maintains a bodhicitta motivation and isn't polluted by afflictions while giving. And then prior to giving, wisdom is needed to know what, when, and how to give. While giving, contemplating the emptiness of the giver, gift, recipient, and active giving cultivates wisdom. So you're practicing generosity, but the generosity is imbued with the other five. Or then you're practicing ethics, and ethics is imbued with the other five, right? So you're wanting to like keep them all together with each action. And that way you're preventing all sorts of pitfalls. Pitfalls of over-identification as somehow being like a good person, <laughs> right? And getting kind of arrogant and proud. But you're also avoiding pitfalls like, I don't know, doing it for the wrong reason, for kudos, for fame, for whatever. You're also doing it in such a way that if it doesn't work in a worldly sense, that doesn't kill your momentum. You know, like how many times have we given something to someone and they were like, oh, thanks. And they were not impressed and they were not excited. And we thought that they would love it and they didn't. And then you're kind of like, oh, I really put a lot of thought into that, you know, and you're kind of like sad about it. Yeah. But if you do this with the perfections, particularly the perfection of wisdom, then you know that things are not going to give people happiness from their own side. Yeah, lots of conditions have to be in play for it to work and land. 
your motivation has to work and land, their re receptiveness has to work and land, the object, all sorts of things have to come together for something to work. So if you know that going in, you know it's worth doing because it's a good practice, not because you're trying to achieve instant gratification of yay, now they like me, you know? So you're avoiding all these pitfalls before you even begin. Is it making sense? Okay, so are there any questions or um, ideas popping to mind before we have a little stretch break? So far so good? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's have, um, what, five minute break or 10 minute break, what do you think? Five, yeah, okay, five minute break and um, then we'll have a meditation and a little follow up.
coming back. Okay, coming back and uh, getting ready for a meditation. Okay. <clears throat> So start by connecting with your posture. And just take a minute to really feel the sensation of being physically alive, both pros and cons of that. So just be in your body for a moment and scan through with a mind that is checking what is working well and comfortable and where is there some tension or stress maybe some pain and just be with your body checking in with it You can scan from the crown of your head all the way down to the tip of your toes with a very warm and kind gaze towards your own body. Where you meet areas of comfort, seeing them with kindness and appreciation. When you meet areas of discomfort, meeting them with compassion. Just the body. and invite anything that is clenched or held or tightened, invite anything of that stressed type to release if it's ready and if it's not, let it be. and shift gradually from awareness of the body to awareness of the mind. See if you can watch the mind with some objectivity, noticing if you're tired or awake, 
noticing if you're energetic or lethargic. Noticing the atmosphere of your mood. Just be with the mind watching without engagement. And the mind might want to drift to memories or plans, wanting to rush to fill the space with something dramatic or entertaining. And just choose not to add. Let the thoughts think what they want, but make the choice not to add. Not agreeing with your thoughts, not disagreeing with your thoughts, no push or pull, just let them be. Keep watching. Keeping your focus bright and vivid, spacious, not spaced out. And as the distractions start to settle, as the mind gets a bit more spacious, now gently invite a very calm analysis. And ask yourself, what is your response to the idea of bodhicitta? How does it land to think, wanting to become enlightened or perfect? Perfect happiness, perfect ability, perfect wisdom, my fullest potential. How does it feel to aspire to that as a means of benefiting both yourself and others? Just take a long, really honest look at your relationship with that concept of bodhicitta.
if our status quo is that we're relatively happy, relatively useful, why do we need to become a Buddha as an individual? Things are tough sometimes, but not always. We're useful sometimes, but not always. But that's just being human. What's the big deal about development? Why is our potential something to pursue? And so then you can think that we can achieve temporary happiness with the right conditions and mentality. And we can achieve temporary benefit to others with the right resources, with the right conditions. But do we really understand the causes for long-term sustainable happiness? and long-term sustainable benefit to others. Something more than just symptoms relief. And so we think in order to benefit both ourself and others, we need to become free from samsara, the cyclic existence that our negative habits, attitudes create. So let's start by thinking about ways to create positive habits, to repeat the things that we already value, but make them deeper and more vast. And so start by thinking about this word generosity, which could include physical, verbal, or mental actions based on a kind intention and the willingness to give. How does generosity land when you bring it into your heart? What is your relationship with it so far?
Is it a habit that you want to develop? Or even one to replace a negative habit of selfishness or miserliness, greed? And how is your mind on days when you genuinely have the intention to give? When you genuinely are in that mode of either host or service or leadership or friendship, when you just genuinely want to offer whatever is needed and you don't have a ton of expectations about its success or being seen, just kind of feel your way into how you are in those moments. Those giving moments, how is it for you? And then picture how it is to be around you when you're like that. How is it for your friends or family, for coworkers, for strangers, anyone, when you're in that intention to give open-hearted way? Imagine what it's like to be around you then. You can use memories or logic. And then shift, what is it like when you've prioritized ethics, meaning restraint from non-virtue or restraint from harming? When you're being actively non-violent with your words, with your actions, with your internal dialogue, when you genuinely don't want to hurt anyone, when you're being careful, not out of anxiety or reputation, but the genuine wish not to do harm. How is it for you in that place?
And then imagine what it is like for other people when your motivation is ethics, the way they might feel safe with you, not judged or criticized, not under threat. Imagine how you are to be with when this is your focus. And so then you can assume that there is a similar type of benefit for both yourself and for others when you're practicing patience, when you're practicing joyous effort, concentration, wisdom, that all of these are of mutual benefit. A calm contentedness in your heart, an ease people have with you. And this is before they're even qualified by bodhicitta. So how much more so if they were? And so if it feels authentic, if it feels natural, think to yourself, may all of my energy go towards these perfections. May all of this energy go towards the fulfillment of my potential, enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And in this way, benefiting both myself and others. And we think that all of these ideas are boiled down into the mantra, Om Mani Peme Hum, which embodies and represents all six perfections. And so we dedicate with this mantra while imagining compassionate wisdom going out in all directions benefiting all sentient beings. Just imagine that compassionate wisdom filling you, 
and radiating from you and inviting back to you the compassionate wisdom of all the holy beings. Okay, so you can relax your attention. And if you'd like to shift back into a different posture, that's okay too. So next week we'll start with generosity in depth and uh, different approaches and different ways of engaging with it. But um, are there any questions so far or any follow-up thoughts that you have coming to mind? Just thank you very, very much. I love, love you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Right back at you. Um, yeah, Gompa person. It's not practicing tradition. Um, I'm not familiar with the Asian vow. Mm. Yeah, the Bodhisattva vow. Google that and I kind of find it. Totally. Yeah, if you if you Google Bodhisattva vows, um, FPMT, a nice little booklet will appear in a PDF probably very early in the search. And uh, it's completely fine to study the Bodhisattva vows well in advance of taking them. And they're really interesting. So yeah, Bodhisattva vows, definitely. First one was like, ooh. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, on. that's great. How embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally, yeah. So anybody else? Yes, please. Um I have a question about the prayer that we started with that had verse 101 and verse 102. What is that, please? That is um, an excerpt from Lama Chupa Guru Puja, which is a practice that Dharma centers pre-pandemic would do twice a month. And um, it's the Lam Rim prayer. Um, it's from that section of Lama Chupa Guru Puja. So um, it explicitly goes through each of the six perfections, which is why I chose it, um, but it's part of a much longer practice. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Ramesh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really powerful. Um, when you were um, guiding us in the meditation, you were saying, see these or what if these were imagine or consider these in relation to bodhicitta i was just curious what that name meant because i mm. was not was not my sort of embrace of those bodhicitta itself right yeah no it's a good question um he was asking kind of what's the difference between things like generosity and ethics that we did more in depth as well as the other perfections um, on their own as a practice as opposed to them being a perfection or something with bodhicitta what's the difference between just they're good things to do let's do them yay and <laughs> the upgraded version and the upgraded version is the reason why the reason why. So the reason why could be in daily life from a secular perspective, it leads to a harmonious society and a harmonious society is mutually beneficial. Let's just do that. You know, good enough, right? It's nice to be generous for you. It's nice to be generous for others. Others, you know, if we all live that way, it'd be lovely. Let's just do that. Yeah, from a secular one life only perspective, they're great in and of themselves. We're talking about doing them for the reason of becoming enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, rather than the reason of let's make things nicer now. If your aim is for full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, a side effect is that things will be nicer now, you know? But the energy has a continuing effect that will go all the way to enlightenment rather than end with the activity in that moment in that day. You're really setting your mind to 
I want to actualize my fullest potential. And this is part of the energy driving me there. You know, so it can be a simple thing, like in the example of offering a cup of tea, it can be completely simple, but your reason is different. And when your reason is bigger, your mind is also more spacious and different little like worldly everyday obstacles that make it not happen perfectly also don't get to you as much because you have a bigger reason. Yeah. So if someone says, I don't like that tea, take it away. You're like, well, it was worth doing anyway, because this is part of my internal path of development. It wasn't actually about them getting the tea and drinking it and being happy for five minutes. That was a side effect. And I hope that happens, but it wasn't the point. So I'm not upset if it doesn't work. You know, it's a really, it's a different way of kind of playing with the idea. So by having the highest intention, the simpler things also get taken care of as a byproduct. By staying simple, only that gets achieved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eve, did you want to add? Uh, yeah. Thank, uh, this is a great segue to actually to my question. Um, th first of all, thank you very much for this is one of the this is a teaching with the, <laughs> a lot of clarity. Um, I'm new to Buddhism. So my, my question, but I grew up in mainland China where I was exposed to a different kind of Buddhism. Um, this is Mahayana, Da Cheng Fo Jiao, but we're exposed to Xiao Cheng Fo Jiao. So is it the fundamental difference? And I don't feel related to that. I, I have been um, following some teachings that are more along the line of Mahayana, but right now I know, okay, this is the system, right? So the, what is the fundamental differences? Is it really, is it, is, is it doing it for the sentient being or um, versus doing it for secular reason, pragmatic reason? Um, what, 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 what to you, what, what is the fundamental differences? Yeah. Well, there's, you know, there's forms of, of Chinese Buddhism, like Pure Land Buddhism, which are also Mahayana. You know, we have Mahayana Chinese Buddhism, Mahayana Tibetan Buddhism, lots of branches of branches of branches. You know, there's all sorts of branches. But the, the fundamental difference between the foundational vehicle, which is sometimes called the Hinayana, but it's a slightly derogatory term because it implies lesser. And we just want to say foundational, like essential foundations. So the foundational vehicle the goal is liberation nirvana. So liberation nirvana, which are synonyms, indicates a state beyond sorrow. So getting out of suffering and absolutely wanting to benefit others, but not necessarily with the personal responsibility that your own path is for them the whole way. It's like, you want to be kind, you want to be compassionate, but you're not having this proactive wish to help all sentient beings become enlightened themselves. You're just trying to help them get through the day, not cause any trouble, not hurt them, help them elevate their path, all that good stuff, which is really vital and we can't miss it. But it's different than the Mahayana, which has this added thing of personal responsibility, personal accountability of my path is for them. So they can be enlightened too. So the difference is between nirvana and Buddhahood. Yeah, liberation and enlightenment, the goal. Yeah, And it's, it's often said that if you achieve the goal of nirvana, it will occur to you, Buddhahood would be great. So keep going. Yeah. And so like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, anybody else? Uh, yeah, for Yen Ten, I just wanted to mention really quickly while we're going through the last um, moments of, of uh, questions and so on and so forth that I put in the chat for all of the Zoomers um, the uh, that the next class for the six perfections practice of the bodhisattvas will be scheduled next Wednesday, September 15th from 7 p.m. to 8.30. And I went ahead and put the registration link. So some people are only registered for the one class. So if they'd like to re-register for next class, um, then they can do so. And of course, any people that are in the Gompa, um, we can certainly uh, help you. Anybody who's there in the Gompa can help you find the events calendar on our webpage as well to register for next week's class. So I just wanted to say that very quickly um, before we wrapped up. Thanks, Christina. Thanks very much. And uh, that's probably a good uh, indication for me to look at the clock. So we're five minutes over. So I don't want to make too long a night for you guys. But um, same time next week. And if you're having any hanging questions, uh, write them down because it's a fun way to start the next session. And uh, those handouts are in the chat or on your desk. 
and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>